You know, have you been to my other sessions where I open up with music? Yeah, I normally open up with music. Yeah, so my planning and migrations are, do you know where you're going to? Do, do, do. And then um, I did um, features now more with, cow, with more cowbell, so it was all about like, yeah. <laughs> more cowbell. Yeah, those doodles almost came back because they're all like bands and guitars and everything that almost trickled. It, it is on our Hook 42 shirts. Um, but I wore my Johnny Cash outfit today. It's because, like, I've got to bring a little bit of the Johnny Cash Nashville in here. So. It's so quiet. Are you guys enjoying your time here so far? Okay, good. Lots of good Nashville food. Music, who, who saw live music yet? Ah, awesome. That is fantastic. Yes. I, if you woke up earlier enough to see the pre-note, then yes, it absolutely counts as a live music performance. Yeah. I did, I did not, I'm, I classically, well sometimes I've gone, but it's always like, oh, was I out too late the night before? It's the... Oh, you're quite responsible. Oh, I know, it's so hilarious. Yeah, I just, um, on the day, if I, if I have the, the talk, that I'm doing that same day it's also in like oh I just need to go in a corner and have a moment before the talk so okay we've got a couple more minutes so we'll wait for people to mosey on around so I talked to somebody that lives here and this is a really new conference center they just this is like the first year do you live here oh fantastic you know more than that but it's basically pretty new and it's all lead certified energy forward oh really oh that's fantastic actually oh that's fantastic oh yeah because I saw in all the signs like all the the washrooms use the rainwater capture So um, for the ladies and the allies in the house, there's a Women in Drupal event tonight. Yeah, it's on the events page. Hook 42 sponsors it because we're women in Drupal and we like to support those things. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good match. <laughs> it's a fun group. All right. So should we start really on time? Because now it's really on time. OK. All right, good afternoon. Hi, come on in, have a seat. Um, if you're in here to talk about what mix of DevOps things is right for your needs, you're in the right place. My name is Amy Degnan, and I'm the CEO and Principal Architect at Hook42. Today we're gonna cover the what and why and how we got to DevOps. Um, some of the how uh, through concepts and tools keywords, and also talk a little bit about choosing your DevOps solution. Just some disclaimers here. Um, it's a really broad topic. Um, this is not a huge deep dive everywhere or anywhere. And really these topics, sessions warrants, or these topics like warrant their own sessions and co conferences, and, and they do have them, or days and days of training. Um, if you're expecting for me to mention a tool, just hold tight. Uh, we'll get there um, because the order of it kind of is like everybody gets really antsy. I've done this session a couple of times and they're like, hey, hey, when's that tool? When's that tool? When's that tool? I'm like, whoa, it's okay. We'll get there. Um, but if I miss one, please, by all means, bring it up in the question and answers. And there's a lot of words because it's a really dense topic, and, but I'll be posting a PDF version right after the session on the session. The goals here is to gain understanding, consider the impact of DevOps to your business, identify relationships all throughout DevOps, and also think differently. 
Um, I normally don't talk about myself in presentations, but um, it's important to understand where I came from and why am I doing this session. Um, I, was, I am a child of a network and systems specialist from a small company called General Electric. He helped set up the internet. Um, so I was exposed to very forward networking, com network computing since a, a young child. Um, I went to school for sports medicine and athletic training and figured out I couldn't fix an ankle as good as I can fix a computer. So I switched over and I became a, a systems administrator across multiple platforms and custom hardware. I was really lucky I got to work at Electronic Arts um, and set up a, a lot of their online gaming infrastructure and large-scale deployments of their um, EA.com platforms. Um, there, I kind of evolved from a CMS specialist, web application developer, and an enterprise architect. And then I was like, wow, this stuff isn't really working because some of the decisions that are made at the higher business level aren't just really valid for what I should be doing technically. You can see a lot of gaps and disconnects. So I, I just said, oh yeah, project managers can handle that. And so I did some project management at Ubisoft and, and HealthNet. Um, and then evolved into a process improvement engineer, so how to take metrics and make broken things work better. And then evolved in a strategic direction. And really the end, I was, as a technical person and an old school curmudgeonly sysadmin at heart, uh, I wanted to be in the most effect, effective position to influence like informed change, right? And, and DevOps is all about change and managing change and supporting change. So I'm gonna talk about um, why did I use the word things in the title? Well, I wanted to remove word baggage, right? Because there's terms in DevOps that mean multiple things to multiple people based on the experiences you have or maybe the blog article you read or somebody is running around with a flyer somewhere. Um, so we're gonna clarify DevOps terminology and context of concepts. And I can say that 10 times fast. Um, so this is kind of fun. Cloudy with a chance of DevOps is kind of how a lot of things happen in DevOps. Um, and it's, a, it's not very clear, but it's kind of silly. It's just, I'm, I'm sorry if I do dad jokes in the middle of this. <laughs> But um, this is from Bridget Cromhout from Pivotal Labs. She's a, ver a leading uh, DevOps uh, champion. Um, so what is DevOps and why does it evolve? So simply, it's software development plus IT operations. Um, so that's where the name came from. And it also contains QA for business alignment. So I love Venn diagrams. There it is. Thanks, Wikipedia. Um, but really, it's this combination of a lot of different mindsets. To, um, to achieve a specific outcome. And um, why did it involve in humanity? Okay, so um, I did lots of large scale systems administrator. This is the exact Blackberry version I had. Uh, and I got like called lots of times. And what the, the systems administrators would think is, why don't the engineers write code that will not continually break production at 3 a.m.? Okay, and then the developers are like, why can't I have root on production and fix all the things, right? And so that is something that's been an ongoing battle um, for a long time. It still happens. Um, but really, as like things evolve, the new systems administrator goal is to be Conan the deployer. And really, the best thing in life is to continuously integrate your services to see the test suites fail and to have engineering lament about it while you are not wake, woken up at 2 a.m., right? So it's like, hey, give the engineers their tools to do what they need to do without having to page everything and break production. Um, but really, let's take it up a level. What does what does the business want with any IT operations or web operations? They want an efficient and strategic use of the available resources, time, money, team, tech, to achieve faster time to market, improved deployment frequency, um, increased deployment frequency, shorten lead time between deployments, lower fail rate, and faster time to recover, recovery. So remember these concepts because that's the driver of all of your DevOps types of choices, okay? These are the core goals that drive what choices you make on your tool set. 
really give me the best product for the fastest thing so I can make some money and like slam the competitors. Um, also, what happens is to actually really make those goals, a cross-team collaboration is necessary to reach those, right? Um, because the applications grew more complex. The applications needed more computing power. They needed to be bigger, more complex environments that integrated all the things. You, and then we did a big movement from a build and ship software to like bought a DVD before or a CD of like a video game or some software, yeah, in physical. That's a completely different development cycle than a continuous online software uh, cy cycle. And it was great because I was at Electronic Arts very early and it's a, it was a very build to ship software company and to, to help transition a lot of that development team, operations team and business to an, a continuous mindset. That was, this was in like 2000, 99, 2000. It's a long time ago, uh, but it was a huge shift in thinking, and it was very difficult, and it takes some folks still time to move that over. Um, now we're having this other additional challenge which to support the Internet of Things, right? So you have a hybrid hardware solution, like your Fitbit or your ho home control software, and an online interface that is showing the data that you, you interact with. Um, but really, in the end, it's you have to support more with the same amount of people or less. Right? So pushing for more, want to spend less, maybe want to spend different money. Okay, so this is a beautiful kind of diagram here of the DevOps process. And what's beautiful about this, it's continuous. It doesn't end. Um, what's interesting is like there are some phases that are heavier on the dev process here, on the, the dev land. Um, but, and there's some processes that are heavier on the ops side of things. But this is, and we'll get into this later, but the ops side of thing has a lot of support um, that happens in the dev process. And vice versa, dev has to be very involved with the operations phases. So just because there are these two groups doesn't mean they're segregated. There's a lot of overlap and a lot of collaboration on every phase of the dev op process. So I'm going to do process management 101 because it's really important to understand that a process is the people and systems performing the action, performing actions in repeatable order with predictable outcomes. Repeatable, predictable, people, and technology. Things are transferred between each step. Success, code, um, you know, an error message, that type of thing. Um, and decisions are made based on that transfer of things. And then you collect metrics throughout the process and for review and adjustment within the planning phase, so you can see, oh, how many times did that handoff of the thing break? How many, how fast did it take? That type of thing. Um, and if you think about it like that, the basic process structure, it really drives a lot of the characteristics of DevOps. Very inter interconnected. Some of the main DevOps characteristics, it's connected. See, I just said connected. I'm going to say connected a lot. Uh, the cross team, right? So you have business owners, and you have QA folks, and you have engineers and operations, all sorts of folks, cross role, cross system. Um, we want to really drive for parity and equality. So making sure everybody is working with something that is as close to production or similar to production as you can. Um, velocity, movement, speed, forward movement, and this is a characteristics of DevOps. Continuous, repeatable, automated, and also very early error detection. So bring these characteristics with you. And we're going to talk about continuousness, because that's fun. Um, so if you look at DevOps and you hear about all of these words, there's like continuous DevOps, continuous integration, and continuous development, and continuous quality, continuous testing, delivery. There's so many continuousnesses. Um, uh, and uh, and I, this is like a screenshot of Google. I'm like, yeah, there's even more, right? And so sometimes there'll be uh, some teams will call some t the same type of con continuous thing a different word than somewhere else. And it's is it a marketing thing? Is it a keyword? reach for SEO? Are they trying to kind of expand a concept? I'm not sure, but as you research tools 
and come um, come to understanding with what you're looking at. Just make sure, like, if the words sound kind of similar, then it, they might be saying the same thing. But continuous delivery is not the same as continuous deployment. Just want to call that one out. Continuous delivery is always making features. Continuous deployment is always putting the files on the server. Um, this is a nice visualization that I found um, because you see the image that I just showed you with the nice infinity symbol kind of represents this one flow, but really the continuous activity happens within each phase as the DevOps activities happen. So you have continuous planning and continuous integration and each one of these areas feed into the next step, right? So you have to plan what you're going to build, you're going to, you have to build and test what you're going to build, then you release it, and then you just, then operate, you keep it uh, stably live in production, and then that customer experience help, like, interacts with your end product. And then throughout this whole thing, there is a platform of continuous assessment, which is metrics, and review of things that are broken. And you have this c continuous security. It, it's across all of the parts of the system. So uh, it's, it's everything is connected. Everything is continuous. Um, and then there's a big thing about automation. And, and some people will be like, do I really have to automate all the things? Because maybe they don't know how to automate it. Or maybe they know it, it may be a daunting task. And some people are like, oh my god, I'm gonna automate all the things because they love automation. And they're like, I'm going to automate everything. Um, and then really what we look to is to keep calm and automate all the things because then everything is zen and things keep moving. And um, automating all the things is, like an all is a big word, um, but you want to automate the things that are, that can add efficiency and consistency reduce human error, reduce machine error. Um, you want to have your automation be a force multiplier. So if you can take that time to write automation scripts, and then it releases that person who wrote them to do other work, then that's fantastic. Um, we also want to reduce time to market and capture metrics along the way. So some of the challenges of DevOps is like, really, what do I choose? It's so confusing. Um, it has a really quickly changing and vast tool market and all of the words. We just talked about some of the words and they're, the words are getting funner and hipper and, and, and what, is the, what do they all mean, right? Because they meant something five years ago or they didn't or that now they're meaning something different. Um, and also what is the hippest thing? Like do I need to look at the coolest, best new thing on the market but is it right for your needs? So there's like this moment of evaluating the DevOps kind of uh, environment to see what you need. What's wonderful is this no-ops movement. Who's heard of no-ops before? OK. Um, really, I, I looked a lot about getting a firm definition of it. Um, and conceptually, it's an evolution of automation into intelligence oper intelligent operations. Um, Pantheon, I was overhearing some of their demos and they're talking a lot about their kind of movement into a no-ops type of thing. Um, but really the ph philosophy around no-ops is like the IT environment is, is abstracted so much from the developers that you don't need a dedicated team to like manage all the infrastructure. But the infrastructure actually does need to exist somewhere. Um, some type of infrastructure needs to exist, and we'll talk about where those things can exist later. But some uh, characteristics of no-ops is serverless programming, um, containerization, um, like we already use a lot of Docker, Drupal VM, so more containerization. Um, moving to a microservices architecture so you don't have monolithic sites. Um, and intelligent and unified operations. So that's like monitoring and deployment uh, and log tracking is actually being um, watched by something that goes, hey, I'm going to look for these error patterns. And it's also going to have some self-healing. When they see an error pattern, it knows how to fix it. So instead of calling um, the sysadmin or a developer to fix it, the system already knows to self-heal. Um, and they're doing a lot of movements into a more seamless type of rollback, and it's, it's really a fantastic thing. Um, uh, so really quickly, you can see how 
um, the internet's involved, or evolved, the, the internet infrastructures. So in the 90s, it's all data centers and iron, right? And I'm just going to tell you, like, the cloud still runs on servers, just so you guys don't, yeah, it's, the cloud is not a gaseous place of, like, hard drive space. Um, but really what we started moving in into is virtualization and APIs and then evolution into that first round of, like, uh, sys sysops area, like cloud ops, yeah. right? And But we're really evolving into no ops. And actually, no ops was a movement that was brought up in 2013. Um, but what happens is all the tools and the support and um, uh, the supporting languages, they're all getting more mature so they can get closer to a no ops movement. Um, I had this discussion um, with an old sysadmin friend of mine, and, and we had this you know, is no op something that's going to be like Shangri-La, right? Because at some point, stuff, something's going to break and you're going to have to call somebody with systems background to like help you. Um, and I think that that will always exist. I just want to be optimistically realist here. <laughs> um, but it's a good, good place to go. And where can I find me some no ops? Um, the market's maturing quickly, like I was saying. You can visit some of the hosting vendors here. They're already tying in these types of intelligent operations and systems here. Um, the, and that vision is really pushing growth through the classic DevOps. The need for having um, infrastructure that's already there um, for developers to use without having IT investment is a really strong message that these hosting providers have been hearing. And I want to address one thing, because this is the good kind of place to do it. Um, it kind of seems like, well, that will put a lot of IT workers out of their job, right? And that's not really the case, because these big infrastructures to support a no-ops environment needs to be supported by someone that has that type of background. So the people building the infrastructure for no-ops tools are going to be that, the classic IT folks and development operations engineers. Um, so the DevOps culture, you can't just do DevOps, you need to live DevOps. It's true, and, and it's a very zen moment, so let's take that together. In the, the people that exist in DevOps, developers, so they're tasked to build forward-changing features for the business. They might not understand network computing very well. So who is a developer here? Who, who identifies as a developer? Do you feel like you have a firm understanding of network computing? OK, that's less people that raised their hand, right? Um, but they often use the tools created by DevOps and IT engineers. Right, to do their jobs, so they have to understand the tools. The IT ops team are intensely cautious. They test a lot, measure many times before they press the button. We're really paranoid that production will break because it will, and they will get the call because that's what their job is, is to get paged. Um, and they really are tasked to understand full impact of the overall system change. Not just like what's on the server, but the server, the application, the networking, everything that's chained together, that's the IT ops historic responsibility. Um, but then you come in and have this concept of a DevOps engineer, and they really represent the crossover, the two roles. They bring the best from both. They have a, a large amount of paranoia to help them create the non-breaking, very repeatable tools <laughs> that improve confidence across the teams, right? So you have to take a lot of that uh, same characteristics out of somebody in IT and ops historically, but with uh, that really want stability, and they want to balance that with that driving need to move forward. So some skills assumptions, just really quickly. All technical staff supporting DevOps need to know more in general. There's a higher mental load than historically because they have to be more cognizant of what the other person is doing in, the other, in their dev process. Um, some of the technical staff may not have the skills for DevOps tasks. So you might have a front-end developer that does not know how to create their own gulp scripts. They might not know how to get the compilers put together. They might need to, because maybe they're junior, and they're doing all right on some front end stuff, but you, they don't know how to get their infrastructure set, so you need that type of help. 
Um, so some may not have the desire to be a DevOps engineer. Who loves DevOps in here? Okay, who hates it? Okay, there's a love and hate relationship with both of those, right? So, um, and I think, I, I feel both. It's a love and hate thing. Um, but I actually love the fact, like, when you press a button and you can, like, deploy code to thousands of servers and you can see nothing is failing and everything is good and you can, it, like, rest easy at night. I think it's fantastic. But I really want to take away that all technical staff should be able to use the tools that DevOps creates. Right or no ops, right? All the people on your technical staff are, st are stakeholders of the DevOps tooling process. Um, so very quickly, a developer at, uh, evolution, how could they evolve into a DevOps engineer? It's like, yeah, they learn how to code, they're playing around with their own dev tools, then they're like, oh, I wanna grow into a full stack dev. Uh, then they start integrating things, so that integration requires a little understanding of systems and networking and security. And then boom, they might just evolve into someone that has interest in DevOps because they have the supporting skill set now. On the sysadmin side, um, you have to un you understand the system, you can install things, you can get a computer on the network, oh, I have to install software on it, um, I have to support that software on it. I need to do full stack debugging of that software and our custom app because it's in the two in the morning and something broke and I have to figure it out. Um, and so they start dabbling in application development and evolve up to DevOps. So what's interesting here is cross team alignment matters. Um, historically, like, and still, still now, um, incentives may be different from each team. Right, success measures may be different, and accountability may be different. So, like for development, how many features can I get out the door? Right. So that's the, the, the continuous delivery. Um, maybe they have a metric like I need to get X amount of features out the door, and then the operations team has a completely different metric, which is how stable is the overall system? Like, is it up? Is it performant? Am I not getting people like my customers complaining about the site? Um, th so the problem with this is the dev team team's like, yeah, let's crank them out, boom, 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 boom. But if they crank out a bunch of uh, unstable, buggy features and you don't catch that earlier, that number is seemingly good for dev, but it's really bad impact on ops and it causes an unstable environment. And so this is a huge impact to culture. So you have this wall of confusion, like the two teams are separate and there's finger pointing. And it goes back to why did you make me wake up at 3 in the morning to fix your stuff. And no one wins out of this situation, right? Um, so when we bridge the gap, there's no silos. There's only the total team. Um, there's full transparency of information across the DevOps process. Um, you have open and frequent communication, communication rewarded, right? And make sure that the team's performance metrics are tied together, are aware of each other, and also it's, um, tied to the overall DevOps process, right? So instead of just having one team's accountability, it's, it's accountability for the whole success. And really, you have to make sure that you use data-driven work for that accountability. Um, and the big thing about uh, DevOps culture is that the business needs to support the DevOps culture, especially if you're going kind of to an older school an older school, very separate and segregated um, development IT staff, um, DevOps will fail without leadership supporting it. So the company must encourage communication, healthy communication. Um, also embracing an agile, nimble approach. They also need to basically figure out if they're gonna reorganize their, their, um, uh, the teams if, to make sure this matches that what they need. Um, they have to invest time, money, team and faith, like wow, this is gonna be hard for some industries to like, hey, I gotta, I gotta take this leap of faith um, because I have all these tech guys telling me that I should do this and the business is like, well, show me why. Um, and that's part of this, why this uh, conversation exists. Um, but also really once again, data-driven decisions to guide growth. You can't have someone be like, I just feel like this today and that tomorrow. It's very difficult to have that business leadership that's not going to be grounded to help the DevOps changes. Um, and DevOps is work. DevOps takes time and it must be addressed as such. So budgeting, putting it on your product roadmaps, that type of thing. Um, and a surprise benefit of DevOps 
is the platform of continuous learning. Um, so basically, when you have these cross-functional engaged team members working together on this overall process, it provides understanding across the board. Um, people have exposure to more tools and techniques and it provides them opportunities to go, oh yeah, I really want to do that over there. Or, I, I really hate this development, I'm going to go be a PM, but I like this infrastructure, I can do that. So it's opportunity for growth for all. So the DevOps tool chain. Um, so just to hear, um, <laughs> Uh, a tool chain is something that you'll see a term used for the multiple amounts of tools that you can use on the system. Um, there's some overarching concepts that we're going to touch on, and these are text heavy, I'm sorry, but just hold tight. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about self-hosting versus hosted solutions. So self-hosting is the installation and configuration upkeep of one of your DevOps tools, or many of them, on a server completely managed in and by your organization. This is in addition to all the work that's required to support your business applications and your website. So um, like you can, you can have a self-hosted Atlassian stack, you can have your self-installed Git servers. You can have your self-installed GitLab. Where hosted solutions are a pay for services where you just like plug it in. Hey, I'm going to just start using this. And all you have to do is focus on your business goals. So has anybody heard of GitHub? Sorry, I'm being sassy now because it's the afternoon. Maybe Pantheon, Acquia, you know, Platform, all these guys. Um, also Circle CI, Travis CI, GitLab. There's a lot of these hosted solutions that will, e, that will um, allow you to not have to focus on that infrastructure. So it's that movement to a no-ops infrastructure. Um, there's single function tools and solution suites. So a single function tool will serve like one thing, like you know, Behat, Cucumber, our testing tool, Selenium tool you know, is a testing tool. So they focus this one part of of activity in the in the, all the phases. Now you can use those testing tools um, to build and test and on your development environments, but you can also use 